Okay, so we thought we would show you guys what we implement as the mainstay of the Rain Room concept and how we've, instrument, how we've included an instrumented treadmill into clinical practice, as well as uh, semiactesis, which is a high-speed motion capture system using active markers. So we're lucky enough to have uh, Malcolm join us, and Malcolm's got some or a history of left knee pain predominantly um, that's plagued him for some years. Um, Mel's a fit guy. He runs around twice a week, recreationally, around four to five Ks um, at what he thinks is around that sort of 5.30 to, to five minute pace. So his knee pain is described as anterior knee pain. Um, seems from uh, what we can uh, tell that it's you know most related to uh, runner's knee, patellofemoral in origin. So we're gonna go over and see if we can find anything and just showcase how quickly we can grab some data from this treadmill and how we can influence but we can use it to influence our, our clinical treatment. And is there anything we can do uh, as a quick win for Malcolm using gait retraining? Um, but we'll see what we see when we get him running. So I always get my runner, jump on the uh, treadmill for us, Mel. We're going to take you up to that at speed. Yeah. And we're just going to habituate to the end of the treadmill. So I just want you to get familiar with it. So I've just got Mel running here at six minute pace. He's just gonna warm up here for a moment. You can see that the Zebra's treadmill is now giving us uh, a live feed of force and also pressure, as well as we've got a camera looking at some of the posterior capture. And so I'll often have a TV screen in front of the runner where I can demonstrate to them exactly what they're seeing. Sometimes I'll turn it off if I don't want them to change any of their, their parameters of gait. But more often than not, I'll actually get them to have a look um, at what they're doing whilst they're running. If I'm using, if I want to implement a gait retraining tool, I may even get them to run with this uh, on the TV screen, and I'll get them to try and reduce that peak force um, as they're running. But now we're just trying to get a capture. So what I would do here, you can see I can drag this around and start looking exactly where that loading is going to the foot. Um, and then we take a 30 second sample typically of what the runner looks like. Uh, whilst they run. So we're just going to habituate Mel to the treadmill here for a moment. We did have him running just before we jumped on here uh, for around five minutes. And this is semiactesis. So what we're doing here is we've got a high speed camera and uh, we've got active markers on different bony landmarks. So we've actually got one here on the neck uh, in line with the trunk. We've got one here on the radius of banner one on the lateral joint line, and I've got one immediately distal to the uh, uh, lateral malleolus, and then one on the fifth metatarsal. Now, sometimes the uh, markers that you put on the shoe need to be placed a little bit um, above the fifth met, only because some of the soles and the stack height in the shoe may interfere. So we're just gonna get now to go for a little run here, and we're gonna take some data. So as I push capture and uh, start acquisition, you can see that this camera is now tracking those joint angles in real time. Now, really nice for gate retraining as well. We can actually set um, a, uh, a, a sound if someone is overstriding or sinking down too far. Different parameters that we want to engage if we want to use uh, this as a gate retraining tool. But for now, we're just having a look at uh, how Mal looks in the sagittal plane. And then what I'll do is take a 30 second sample here of uh, now running on the Zebra treadmill, and then we'll take a bit of a deep dive and have a look at, at what signs you may exhibit. No pain there, Mel? No, no. Good. So Mel's just running at six minute pace. And then often what I'll do is I'll ramp them up speed as well. So I'll actually start having to look at Mel when he runs faster at 5.30 pace, and then might uh, start tracking him at five minute pace. I wanna see, is there any change of different speeds? In this case, all we're gonna do is just take a look at um, Mel's capture at six minute pace, which is self-selected uh, for him in terms of speed. And um, in the interest of time, we won't take uh, any more captures. Perfect. 
Just stay there, mate, and take a look up here. So this is exactly how I would do it in clinical practice. Um, I would always ask the patient for symptoms and how they were going. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the zebra starter first. So you can see how quickly we can generate um, this data and start having a look at, at, at the capture here. So all I want to do, I always want to do things in a systematic way. And just before we start, you can see that I can zoom into each of force curve and pressure curve. And uh, just to orientate yourself around the screen, every red curve is going to be a left um, foot strike and every right uh, curve is going to be a green um, uh, green colored curve. So if we come down here, we can actually zoom into the curves and take a look at, you know, some of these loading rates. Um, we can take a look at the impact peaks through here and the active peak as well. Um, you'll notice that this uh, is synced up, this timeline is synced up not only with the pressure plate here on the left as we move through uh, this time graph, but it's also synced up with the camera as well. So you can see that as I drag across here, we're going into left initial contact uh, on the screen and then going pushing through to left mid stance and then eventually getting to left toe off before we we hit the right side so for a moment let's just forget about these curves um, and let's just show you what we can look at in terms of uh, foot strike and on the pressure plate so if i want to see exactly how many newtons are going through different areas of the foot and it might be more relevant for different conditions um, particularly around, um, you know, bony stress injuries and things like metatarsalgia. Um, we may want to see, is there any hotspots going on in the foot? And it's a really nice way to be able to show the patient uh, visually how much load may be going through different areas of the foot. As well as if we want to go clinically and have a look, I can actually zoom in and get a really nice idea of exactly how many newtons of squared, uh, per squared centimetre is going through different areas of the foot. And we really like doing that um, if we're applying an intervention, and it might be a change in, it might be taking the foot to shift some load around. Um, it could be seeing what um, role an orthotic has, for example, which may be relevant to um, some of you guys listening to this. And then finally, I can also use um, these roll offs. So now what I'll get is I'll get a left uh, and right, um, really nice visual representation of exactly what's going on while someone runs. Um, I actually like to turn on the center of pressure data here as well. And we can get a really nice idea of what's going on with foot strike um, and where that center of pressure tracks as someone moves from initial contact uh, through to mid stance and then in through the to toe off, uh, which I really like doing. So let's take a look now visually. And this is what I would be telling the patient. So I would say, hey, we wanna do things in a systematic way. And from the posterior capture, I always like to look um, just to be uh, do things in, a, in an orderly fashion is have a look at the left side first. Um, and what I do is I come through here and I'm looking at left initial contact. The first thing I do is as the foot strikes the ground, I want to drop two lines. So I drop a line from the midline and I drop a line straight down from the hip joint. And I'm looking for where this runner lands in relation to those two lines. We don't want uh, the runner to exhibit a crossover sign, so land on a tightrope. Um, and we don't want them landing directly under the hip here, but we want them landing closer to this blue line. So often you'll see that this is a sign that um, people may exhibit, particularly with knee pain, iliotibial um, symptoms, you know, ITB compression. Um, and so it's just uh, sometimes that we'll see this and there's different ways in which we can change that. The next thing I do from initial contact to mid stance, what I want to look at or that shock attenuation phase of running is what happens here. And I've leveled these shorts up with um, Mel's pelvis with the PSIS. I'm looking at as he shock attenuates, what happens here at the pelvis? Does he get uh, any hip drop going on here? Does he have a compensated trunk lean? And then finally, what I want to do at mid stance is start to look at if I drop a line from the hip joint to the heel, what happens with this knee? And it's actually occurring at the hip here, but does he exhibit any form of hip adduction, internal rotation, you know, that valgus kind of angle? And that is often something that we'll see in uh, subjects who have patellofemoral pain. And so you can see here that, that Mal does have um, quite a marked adduction moment going on here. And that's something that we see that may not change with um, strengthening. If you look at the, the research, if we strengthen the lateral hip, um, often um, what we used to think was that that would fix a lot of this. We see that hip drop and adduction may not change kinematically. However, we may be strengthening up this tissue and strengthening up the quad to build tissue capacity 
um, as well as using some other gate retraining cues that can help with uh, to slow down or stop some of this uh, adduction moment. And that might be, you know, don't let your knees touch. It could be run slightly wider. Um, even a cadence cue to shorten up the stride length can have a, a, a impact, an impact on that. So a little bit of an adduction moment there. And then I want to do exactly the same thing in the other side. So I'm coming across and having a look at initial contact on the right now. <clears throat> I drop a line straight down. And then I'll drop a line down from the hip joint and have a look again, where is this running landing in relation to the midline? You can see a bit of a crossover both sides. Um, and I do exactly the same thing from, uh, from initial contact to mid stance. I wanna start having a look at what goes on here at the hip and the trunk. Do we have a contralateral hip drop? And do we have a compensated trunk lean as well as what's going on here again with this adduction moment um, and internal rotation going on at the hip. So, you will get a better representation of this um, when we have a look at a frontal plane capture and we're going to go over that uh, in a moment but it's just a really nice easy way for you to start tracking some of these variables that may matter for particularly patellofemoral pain you will see this a lot and we always say that it's a causation not a correlation in that uh, we may see a runner who exhibits these signs but actually doesn't have any patellofemoral pain um, once we see someone with knee pain, patellofemoral pain, more often than not, we'll actually see this, this occurring. I then want to just jump in here and show you guys a couple of things related to the force curves. Now, again, I just want to get a theme, an overall theme. So I'm looking at the force, the top graphs here. Is the higher uh, peak loads going through one side, uh, the left or the right? And you can see here, you know, often some higher peaks going through this left side, which is interesting. This is the symptomatic side. Um, and then zooming onto the curves, we want to start looking at what is the quality of this force curve looking like. And as we get closer, you can see that this is, uh, we're getting an impact peak here, this first part of the curve. And you can see that this correlates here on the left-hand side on the pressure plate uh, with Mel as he hits the ground. So we come across here and that's right on that moment as he hits the ground, we get this impact peak. So we don't always see these and we know in the literature, it's not always relevant, but to smooth out these force curves, is often not a, a bad thing to be trying to do. And there's a couple of things we might show with a little cadence curve that's relevant here, um, how we can do that and what these curves may look like. You know, the steeper this, this line's gonna be, um, the, the more rapid that rate of force development is gonna be applied to the tissue. Um, so often smoothing them out is, is not a bad thing, um, particularly anecdotally in what we see in the clinic um, can have a nice effect on reducing some of that, that loading, those loading rates and can have an impact um, on pain, particularly with you know, the, the research looking at bony stress injuries um, and medial tibial stress syndrome. So that's what I look at mostly um, posteriorly. I do take a bit of a deeper dive as well and start to drum into what goes on through uh, toe off. Are we getting engagement here through uh, the first ray in the big toe when someone runs? Um, and I'll often, you know, you may see someone uh, hit the ground and start, start towing off very laterally and not getting a lot of load going through that big toe. Um, and then we'd, we'd always complete a objective assessment off the treadmill as well um, and start looking at some uh, tissue capacity as well as uh, joint range of motion in the relevant tissues. Let's have a look at uh, Mel Sagley <clears throat> from the side. So I want to show you guys this. This is uh, semi-tesis, and I really like the picture that uh, this will tell to a patient. And patients get this when they can see exactly what we're trying to exhibit. Um, by having these markers on them, it really does play a nice role in educating the patient on, hey, how are you landing? Um, and is can we do anything to reduce some of the loads that are going through or shift some of the loads um, from certain tissues? So let's go through things how, I mean, how we would look at someone in a, in a sagittal plane capture. As someone's hitting the ground, what I'm looking for, you see we just lose that marker with the treadmill arm there, um, which is not to worry because we can actually just add it back in. So it's really easy for us to, let's just track where that marker is. Kill. And what I'm looking for from the side, and, and this is what I'm looking for here. So I'll often drop a line and show the patient as they hit the ground, we want to drop a line from their hip joint to their point of contact in their heel. And what I'm often telling the patient is we want to shorten up this distance in a lot of cases. Now, there's no evidence on how far you should land from your center of mass because it's going to be dependent on how long your legs are. 
Really, the evidence lies in sagittal plane capture on the angulation or the tibial uh, inclination. And we want that to be around uh, five degrees from vertical. Now, this isn't this 5.9 degrees here. It's actually looking at the tibia um, in relation to uh, vertical. And so that will usually correlate with around 20 degrees of knee flexion. So I often say to the patient, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift your heel or your point of contact back here somewhat. And I think we could just increase the trunk lean a little bit. Usually that's between around five to 10 degrees. Um, but trying to land with a more vertically orientated tibia can be a really nice way to deload, particularly things like patellofemoral joint. Um, also, uh, in our experience, things like shin splints. You know, if someone runs with a really extended knee, uh, it can impact some of those loads going through the, the tissue. The next thing we look at is as uh, Mel hits the ground here, I want to look at the quality of shock attenuation. So from flight phase here to initial contact, and then from initial contact here, we're trying to shock absorb, initial contact to mid stance. And what I'm looking for here as a really general rule, a really nice way to show you patients is to actually drop a line from the front of the patella or the knee and drop a line straight down and see how far beyond the toe does that fall. As a general rule, you want that to be going over the big toe. Um, and the ramification that can have is obviously you're gonna have more dorsiflexion here at mid stance. This is actually where peak loading of the Achilles tendon um, will happen or will occur. And it also increase the load going through the patellofemoral joint, the knee, um, the more uh, knee flexion we have at this, at this angle at mid stance. So you can see here that I would say that um, particularly with Mel, that his uh, knee flexion moment is occurring quite quickly. He hits the ground here with quite an extended knee and then flexes that knee really, really quickly. It's a really knee dominant way of, of shock attenuating and then probably has too much dorsiflexion here, as well as too much load going through the patellofemoral joint. Um, so that's one thing that we may try and impact. And uh, how do we impact that is to stop someone sinking down and being too compliant, maybe just to get them off the ground more quickly. So a cadence cue may be relevant here and we'll show you what that looks like. Finally, from mid stance to push off, I'm looking for a couple of things. I wanna see triple extension. So I wanna see the hip start to extend the knee should extend and the ankles should start to plantar flex. Um, I like to track this line as a guide of their shorts and looking at PSIS to ASIS, often I'll mark that as well and start looking at what contribution are they getting truly from the hip joining extension and what contribution are they getting um, from the lumbar spine and, and often people may get excessive anterior tilt, um, which can lead to you know, some tightness in the lower back as well as the hip flexor. Um, doesn't actually look too bad in that position with Mel. And then I just want to see a couple of other things. So you can screen the highest point of gait here, which is mid-flight. And I often draw a line here, or even at the great trachana, to the lowest point, which is mid-stance. And we're just trying to get a gauge now. There's no great numbers on this, but anywhere between six to eight centimetres um, is typically seen as normal. I mean, anything above that, uh, is seen as excessive in terms of how much vertical oscillation someone's getting. So I think the main takeaways here are we definitely have an abduction moment going on um, from initial contact to mid stance, a little too compliant from mid stance to uh, sort of initial contact to mid stance as well in the sagittal plane. And let's just jump into the report from Zebras and see, is there anything that we can implement as a quick win? And I'll just show you some of the data that this, uh, this treadmill gives us and how quickly it can give us this data. So. I'm looking at this, I'm looking at a couple of things. I come down and you can see here with stance maximum where that loading's going um, as someone hits the ground uh, and are they getting, you know, is there any areas of concern or hotspots going on? What kind of contribution are they getting from the big toe? Where's that foot strike gonna be? Um, but the things that I'm really interested in are gonna be uh, things like stride length. And um, we know there's no great normative data on this with running, um, there is with walking, but we want symmetry here in the absence of uh, injury or you know, a leg length discrepancy. We want to try and get things as symmetrical as we can. Um, and we're looking at that here, step length 108, 108 left and right. Um, I track step width, and that's just a measurement of, of that crossover sign. And can we influence it with a certain cue that might uh, widen that up a little bit? And then I come down here and, and I think this is gonna be the quick win for Malcolm. And so if we look at cadence, which is just looking at steps per minute, you can see that um, he's running around at 154 steps per minute. Do we always change that? No, we don't. Um, when it is relatively low and 154 is considered low 
and someone has a uh, injury or symptoms such as uh, patellofemoral pain, it is a really nice quick win to change uh, someone's step rate and potentially increase it just slightly, which can have a direct impact on the loading going through the, uh, the knee. Um, so I'm gonna actually implement a bit of a cue and let's have a look at some of these uh, variables and, and do they change. Um, the things that I'd like to see change is we should get a shortening or a re reduction in step length. We should get a uh, reduced contact times here and spending less time on the ground. And let's see if it has any influence on some of those sagittal plane uh, mechanics in terms of how compliant and maybe potentially even that overstride. Um, so that's something that we'll often look at. Um, we do get center of pressure analysis here as well. And this just tracks exactly what's going on as someone runs, you know, where do they strike the ground and where do they toe off? Uh, and then finally, I do look at peak force. Um, um, for the patient, I often will explain that if we divide this number by 9.8, it can give us kilos and convert newtons to kilos. And I think that's a really nice thing to do um, rather than saying it's you know 1,600 newtons. Patients don't understand that. Uh, but if we can convert it into kilos, people can very quickly understand that that's around 166 kilos going through the left side uh, and 164 going through the right. So um, again, I'm looking for symmetry here. Um, and looking, hey, can we make a reduction? Not always, but sometimes with injury, we'll see that this is uh, gonna spike. Um, other times when people are trying to offload uh, a limb, that you might see a reduction in that, that peak force as well. Um, so let's get uh, Mel going for another run. Let's see if we can have a quick impact on some of the uh, loading. So Mel, what I'm gonna get you to do, just stand wide again, just stand off the treadmill for me, mate, perfect. Let's just calibrate this. I don't want you to change anything about your running. Mm -hmm. We're going to take it to the same speed um, and uh, hopefully you caught some of that, mate. I know that was a bit of, a bit of jargon. No, I'll stay we'll, with you. we'll explain yeah. that in a minute. So what we want to do, the, the research that, that we look at, when we're looking at um, step rate, so how many steps you take per minute, we don't want to increase it too, too much. We actually see that if we, if we increase it by over 10% of your habitual or your normal step rate, it can actually have a negative effect on your running. And so we just want to go with a small change. I think we're going to go around that 5 to 7.5%. Um, so all you're going to do is we're going to take you back to the same speed. So I'm going to just jump on the journal for us and go for a run. And then all I'm going to do, I'm going to turn on my measure over, just a little beating. Yep. And I just want you to we'll try and match that step back. So let's take you back up to six minute pace, which is where you were before. I want you to just try and get this in the head. Just try and think about this. Yep. Feel, yeah. Is it feel like mentally that feels tricky or? Uh, yeah, it feels mentally yeah. more straight yeah. yeah. And what I'm trying to do is trying to think about just getting off the ground a little more quickly. Try and listen to that beat. Back it up. So often what I'll do here, guys, is I'll, I'll often just have a listen to how the runner sounds as well. And I'm talking in terms of their, their foot strike. Um, and does it sound softer? I will sometimes give other cues, but in this first session, often what I'm trying to do is just make a really quick change here and see, hey, does cadence have a positive impact on someone's running? And more importantly, does it have a positive impact on abolishment of symptoms? Yeah. I'm just going to quickly generate a report here.
as you let the runner just get used to this, I'm always asking how their symptoms feeling. Um, it doesn't make them better or it doesn't make them worse as well. It's often an interesting thing to ask. How you going there, Mal? Okay. All good. I'm aware of my back pain. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, yep. no, not to any significant pain. Yeah. Turn that metronome off and get them to run again. And I'm just starting to look at what changes that's going to have with some of these uh, factors, these gate parameters. And let's jump into the data and let's just have a look at was there any changing there? And I think there definitely has been kinematically, but um, let's have a look. So, why don't we start with that? Let's have a look at some of this uh, simi capture. And again, you could see that there was a definite heel strike before. Now we're getting more of that midfoot strike, um, definitely landing with a more vertically orientated tibia. Um, which is something that often we're, we're looking for and looking at. We strike the ground here, we just add this missing marker in the hip joint here. Perfect. So you can see here, we're starting to get closer to that 20 degrees of knee flexion, more definitely a more vertically orientated tibia. Um, and that's a nice within session change. Now, I uh, think that often we want the runner to be comfortable with this. Um, and, and I'd often get them running for a little bit longer on, on the treadmill here. Um, but you can definitely see a, a marked change in foot strike and a marked change in this overstride. Now, we need to be very, very uh, careful here in, in knowing that what when we're shifting load around, we need to know where we're shifting it to. Now, if we've gone from a heel strike pattern, a really gentle heel strike pattern, to be honest, at the start, now to a midfoot strike, what's going to happen? Now, we know we're going to load up the calf complex. Um, and so we better be prepared for that change in load and, and make sure that we're giving some really good quality um, strength and conditioning around that calf complex. It's also starting to give some really nice education on how quickly we would implement this cue and how we would implement it into Melbourne's runs. Um, the last thing we want to do is start giving him, you know, an increase in load and he, he comes back here and his knee feels great, but he's got an Achilles tendinopathy. So just bearing that, bearing that in mind, if you're making a change to someone's running, um, what effect is it going to have on other structures? And then coming down into <clears throat> this position here at mid stance, you can see if we drop this line from patella straight down, still an increase in dorsiflexion um, and potentially maybe reduce some of that knee angle. We can go back into the data, but still too, uh, too much dorsiflexion going on here. Uh, and there may be some other strategies that we, we may implement to change that. But uh, on initial contact, you can see that there's definitely a, a difference in how vertically orientated that tibia is um, and not overstriding as much here for sure. Let's take a look at this. So the first thing I want to look at is, and more often than not, you won't see a, a huge change in, uh, like we see, kinematic variables. Um, you know, we're still going to see a little bit of this adduction moment um, going on through here. So in this first session, more often than not, I'm looking at, hey, was there um, a change to their symptoms? And can we see, if we drum into the data and compare these two reports, what's occurred here with that change in cadence? So let's just jump in and compare them side by side. What we're trying to get here is, um, and just to orientate yourself, Everything in a white box is going to be at 10 kilometers an hour and everything in a gray box, I set that metronome to 163. Um, I would still probably increase that slightly and I'd probably have a bit more of a play around with that. Um, I went between five and, and seven and a half percent um, of his habitual step rate. So you can see that 108 centimeters was the stride length previously on the left, became 103, 
108 became 104 on the right. So there's been an overall reduction in stride length of 10 centimetres there. Step width is very similar at four centimetres. Um, let's see how close uh, Mel got to this metronome. So I said at 163, and you can see that he is able to hold that 162. He's one beat off, which is pretty nice. Um, and it does have a little bit of a reduction here in, in uh, contact times, which is, which is nice to see as well. Then what I want to do is, is just highlight this, that it has made a change to foot strike. And you can see that uh, Mel has shifted where he's striking uh, forward. So again, I just want to highlight that, that it's really important to know where are you shifting that load to and making sure that we're appropriately preparing the, the tissue for that changing load. In this case, it would be the calf, the foot and ankle and the calf complex. Um, then I often look at this. So peak force here, you can see that it was 100, uh, or 1,600 newtons, 660 newtons, and it goes down to 100, uh, sorry, 1,552 newtons on the left, um, 100, uh, sorry, 1,645 newtons on the right, goes down to 1,590. So a, a nice change there in peak load, and we're not always looking for that, um, but often it can be something that we do look at to uh, if it has a, a reduction in symptoms, and, and often you will see that. And then finally, I look at this. I just take a recording when I turn the metronome off. I think it's a really nice way to show the patient that, hey, you don't need the metronome the whole time when you run. You can see now that I've turned this cue off and I've just taken another recording and, and instructed uh, Mel to try and continue to hit that step rate. And you can see he hits 161. So still a, a nice difference from where he started. Um, and I often think showing the patient that is a really powerful thing to do. And then my instructions would be that when you're going outside for a run, use this metronome um, for a minute or two, get it in your head, and then I want you to turn it off. But knowing that we have to, for it to have an effect, a positive effect on someone's uh, loading and someone's running, speed has to be kept a constant variable. So it's very easy on a treadmill. You set the treadmill, in this case, at 10 you increase the step rate, you cannot outrun the treadmill or you hit the front of the belt. When people run outside, you really need to be um, giving those that education around. They need to be looking at whether it's their, their Garmin um, or any of their, their run uh, tracking apps to make sure that their speed is, is kept at a constant uh, variable. So I usually get them to practice that on flat ground first um, and just implement into their run, you know, as you would anything else with a graded loading uh, program. That's all I wanted to highlight with the use of uh, the Zebra Strobel and the Simiac Tesis, we find it really, really nice to track change in, in the runners uh, that we see. And what I would do from here is give some good quality s &C, strength and condition to build some tissue capacity in the structures we know that we're gonna load up, as well as um, some of the things around that we know work really well for patellofemoral pain. So I'd be looking at strengthening the quads in this case, strength, strengthening uh, the glute complex, like lateral hip, glute max, um, and definitely giving, going back to um, calf strengthening. So hopefully everyone got something out of that. Uh, really appreciate your time. And um, Mel, we, we thank you for being a runner today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.